thanks very much for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be back at IHES. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I will indeed talk about integrability in planar ADS CFT and uh, in particular on Jungian symmetry. Um, so let me give you sort of uh, an introduction where, where this talk is situated. Um, so this is about the ADS CFT duality, which you probably know uh, as a proposed duality between string and gauge, or more generally gravity and QFT models. And uh, what made, makes this uh, quite interesting, at least to me, is that some integrable structures have been observed in the planar limit uh, of these models. And um, well, integrability is, is, is a nice word, <coughs> but um, it's, it's of practical use, at least in two ways. Uh, it provides a toolkit for efficient computations um, that you could perhaps otherwise not do. Um, you could also say it's, uh, uh, it has been applied for these systems to, to confirm, uh, well, not ADS-CFT as a whole, but at least some central predictions of ADS-CFT. Um, we, now, we now have much more confidence uh, due to using these integral structures. And another way of, of, of uh, talking about integrability is to say that integrability is a hidden symmetry that's somehow in, in these uh, models. And uh, this symmetry um, is, is, well, at least in this case, it's known as a Youngian symmetry. So <coughs> somehow the goals of, of this enterprise are uh, to improve the understanding of some aspects of QFT and in particular also gravity models in terms of, uh, well, algebraic and analytical mo uh, methods that come along with integrability um, that help you to obtain some or get better understanding of non-perturbative results. And, well, what's also interesting from the math uh, point of view is, is that uh, you get symmetries which are realized in a, in a somewhat unconventional way. So for this talk, um, well, the first 20 minutes or so will be um, a review of, AD, of the ADS-CFT correspondence, um, including integrability. And, uh, and then I will also give an overview of, of uh, some central achievements and where, where this whole thing goes. And at the end, I hope I have some more time to talk about Youngian symmetry, um, which is more the current work that I'm working on. So uh, yeah, let me start uh, simple, um, and, and maybe this also helps to relate this talk uh, to the conference. Um, so, well, you know, ADS-CFT you can view uh, uh, as, as, well, with the goal that uh, you want to understand how strings, um, well, propagate or how they, how they work if, if the target space is not just a, a flat space-time but, um, but a curved space-time. And in particular, once you have a curved space-time, um, all the equations of string theory will be highly nonlinear. Um, in particular, the spectrum of string states will not be uh, easy to understand. Uh, and if you don't understand that, then it's perhaps even harder to uh, address questions like st a scattering of string states. You don't even know how to get started if you don't understand the states too well. So in this, in this sense, the ADS-CFT duality um, um, was a major achievement because it relates a, a string or gravitational theory on some ADS curved target space um, to a conformal field theory on the boundary of this space-time. And um, well, here in this talk, I will mostly address the prototype duality between 2B strings on ADS5 cross S5 and N equals 4 supersymmetric Young-Mills theory, which uh, is, is one particular four-dimensional conformal field theory. And uh, well, there, there are good reasons to look at this example, uh, mainly because it's highly symmetric, um, it's highly accessible, um, but even though, even, even though you have these nice features, these are nonlinear models and um, it's, it's not easy to make com well, reasonable computations that allow you to compare these two models because essentially this is a strong weak duality. But anyway, let me just uh, tell you what these models are. 
So on the one hand there are strings on ADS5 cross S5 which you can view as uh, well the embedding of a two-dimensional world sheet into this 10-dimensional curved target space. Um, from a physics point of view this is a two-dimensional non-linear sigma model um, so it's a well you can or the way I would want to view it is, is it's a two-dimensional quantum field theory of, of a particular um, setup. Um, and it has two coupling constants. There's the world sheet coupling lambda and uh, the string coupling uh, g-string. Or at least these are the dimensionless coupling constants that you can form. Um, it's a weakly coupled model when this parameter lambda is large. Uh, but of course, also you view one, uh, 1 over lambda or 1 over square root lambda as the coupling constant, but here I'll just uh, consider lambda large as the weakly coupled regime. And, uh, and this model has a certain amount of symmetry, and these symmetries come from the isometries of this target space, which is, well, it's, it's actually a supergroup uh, consisting of a conformal group and SU4 combined in a, in a suitable supersymmetric way. Uh, <coughs> on the other hand, there is n equals 4 super young Mills theory. Um, that's more or less a conventional, well, you can view it as a conventional four-dimensional quantum gauge theory model. So you have a gauge field, um, you have four types of fermions, six types of scalars. Um, for the gauge group, I'll typically take SUN or UN, doesn't really matter so much. Um, but there are some particular features about these fields, namely all of them are massless. And all of them are in the adjoint, so uh, everything is, is just an n by n matrix, all these, model, all these fields. So, so here we are, sort of here we arrive at the matrices. Um, and uh, well, the couplings in this model, these are the standard couplings that you would also find in the standard model. So you have non-abelian gauge couplings, you have Yukawa type couplings and phi to the fourth couplings. Um, but these couplings are uh, arranged in a very peculiar way to have uh, n equals 4 supersymmetry. And at the end of the day, there are only two coupling constants, like uh, the Young Mills coupling constant and also the topological angle, which doesn't really play a role here. But the nice thing is, um, you do have uh, a large amount of uh, symmetry, which is not just the space time symmetries or the internal symmetries, but they all uh, combine with supersymmetry and conformal symmetry into this super conformal symmetry, which is the same Lie super algebra or super group that we had for the string model. Um, Supersymmetry is a nice feature. It does help. Um, in particular here, it protects some quantities. And in particular, the, uh, the beta function of this model is exactly 0. Um, that's why you call this a finite model, but it doesn't mean it's, it's anything trivial. Uh, it's, it's a very non-trivial model, but it just happens to have a coupling constant which does not run, and therefore also this uh, superconformal symmetry is, is an exact symmetry of the quantum theory as well. Um, <coughs> it's a model which is weakly coupled for uh, G. Young Mills being small, um, and you can use Feynman, Feynman graphs uh, to uh, do any perturbative expansion. Um, but uh, bear in mind that this is, this is not, an, I mean, it's a well-structured problem, but it's very hard to obtain any sort of data, uh, say, beyond the one-loop level. So it's uh, even computing a diagram like this will not be too easy. Um, <coughs> but there's, there's one interesting limit um, that these two models have. This is the planar limit. In the gauge theory, it's the large NC limit, where, where the rank of the matrices becomes very large. Uh, while the coupling constant becomes small, such that you keep the Toft coupling finite. Uh, and, and this is the coupling lambda that uh, we have in both models then. Uh, for, for the gauge theory, we have only uh, planar Feynman graphs so, um, uh, that survive in this limit. So uh, whenever you have propagators that cross, they will uh, suppress the diagram. And that leads to drastic combinatorial simplifications. But <coughs> you can also you, you also get a um, you also get a two-dimensional structure from that uh, by you know uh, well the, these graphs will you can draw them on the plane and, and then this plane will be a two-dimensional plane which you can relate uh, 
more or less directly to the two-dimensional world sheet of the string. So maybe it's easiest to see this when, when you uh, turn the number of loops to be high and then sort of you see really something like a surface that appears. And then in string theory you get the same limit um, by sending the string coupling constant to zero. And that means, um, yeah, strings will never split or join. Um, and the world sheet will, you know, will always have a trivial topology, maybe typically of, of um, uh, as a cylinder or maybe just a disk. Uh, but you will never encounter some, some splitting or, or joining of, of strings. Uh, or these pair of pens, surfaces or surfaces of higher genus, those would typically be suppressed. Um, maybe, maybe now is a good time to just uh, give a summary of, um, of what, how you relate, uh, how you relate the, uh, the two structures, namely the world sheet and the gauge theory. So for the world sheet, um, well, maybe if I draw it as a cylinder, we have these two directions, which are sigma as the space and tau. And, and this string, uh, lives in some 10D space, which is ADS5 plus S5. And on the other hand, here, we sort of have a 4D gauge theory. And the question is a bit, how, how can you relate these two pictures? Well, and um, I think the key to do this, at least in the framework that, that I will be using, is, is to uh, consider the fields um, these fields are n by n matrices and um, what you can do with matrices is you multiply them and so I'll just depict it like that. All of these are, I mean since all fields are matrices it's easy, you can just <coughs> multiply them to matrix polynomials and maybe you can even close them and you should view this direction as as the spatial direction of the string somehow. So whenever you have a, a polynomial of, of fields um, where you multiply the matrices as a matrix polynomial, um, then this more or less corresponds to, to a string which sort of goes in that direction. It's more something like a discretized string world sheet to some extent. And um, <coughs> yeah, this, this will be the framework that I'll employ in the talk and um, it's interesting in particular because there will be symmetries which act in a non-local fashion on this on this string world sheet and then if you translate this then this works in a somehow non-local fashion on polynomials of the fields um, which are which are polynomials of matrices and I think it's always good to keep this in mind uh, in particular when you are used to talk, uh, working with matrices. Anyway, so uh, <coughs> if you wanted to do any computation in uh, either of these uh, theories, or in particular in the, in the gauge theory, you would use Feynman graphs. But as I said, this is never going to be an easy problem, in particular if you are at higher loops, or if you have Feynman diagrams with many external legs. And the reason for that is simply that, well, all of these legs come along with some space-time data, for example, momenta flowing in. And if you have many momenta, you can combine them in very many ways. And that just means the function, functional dependence on these momenta can be rather difficult, even if you want to respect the symmetries. Um, but the nice thing is that this uh, gauge theory is integrable in the planar limit. And then uh, also the ADS-CFT dual string theory is. And that simplifies some calculations that you want to do in particular. The first thing that, that was understood well is the spectrum of local operators, which we now largely understand how to compute. Um, and <coughs> the nice thing is that <coughs> one can now compute observables not just at uh, perturbatively at small lambda, but even, even at finite lambda or uh, at large lambda and compare them to the string theory. Uh, picture. For example, um, uh, one example I, I can give here is a simple integral equation that, that we've derived for the cusp dimension. Um, 
which I, I'll, I'll just uh, mention that in a few minutes again. Um, but let me let me tell you about this um, this duality to strings. Namely, um, uh, this this is somehow this picture that you have here when when you compose some gauge invariant local operator in the gauge theory. So you take some fields. Um, these are n by n fields, n by n matrices. You take some derivatives of them if you want, um, and you take a product, and then you get a gauge invariant uh, object, for example. <coughs> And uh, depending on how you align these directions, maybe one, one good thing that uh, <coughs> I lost my choke. <laughs> ah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, one thing is, uh, that I should have mentioned is that. Um, of course, the 10 dimensions you also get in this picture from looking at uh, mostly at the indices um, of, of these fields. So if you have a scalar field, there are six different types, or this one, it ranges from 0 to 3. So if you combine these two, you sort of get 10 directions, and, and this is somehow the way you encode the 10 dimensional target space as usual also in matrix models. Um, I thought this was useful to say. Um, <coughs> so somehow by uh, aligning these, uh, the indices of these derivatives or the directions of the scalar fields, you would say uh, you would get sort of um, elementary string states where these directions would tell you in what, in what direction the string excitation modes um, work. Um, <coughs> so that's just the rough picture, if you wish. Um, but there's a nice observable um, quantity that you can associate to these local operators. This is the scaling dimension in a, in a CFT. And in the CFT, the scaling dimension tells you how, uh, say, a two-point function uh, scales with the distance between the operators, and namely this exponent is, is the scaling dimension. And that, in the ADS CFT dictionary, is dual to the energies of these elementary string excitations. Um, so, so much for the <coughs> very um, basic ADS CFT. And uh, what I wanted to show you a bit in more detail is how you get the spectrum, uh, I mean, these, these numbers for either these string states or the local operators from integrability. And uh, for that, there is the uh, beta ansatz technique. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't really want to go into the details, but what it, what it gives you is, is uh, a set of algebraic, mm, well, or just a set of equations that you can solve. And sort of for each solution to these equations, you'll find one state. In, in either of the two models, and for each state you can read off um, the energy or the scaling dimension using a simple formula. Um, but I think what's, what's interesting here is that the coupling constant um, enters these two expressions, <coughs> and it enters them in a, in a way uh, where you have sort of the exact dependence. So uh, lambda, the lambda dependence here is, is a very well, well described form, <coughs> and so you can, uh, in principle at least, uh, solve these equations uh, for small lambda perturbatively, or for large lambda, or for any finite lambda. And even, even the, um, th this expression for the energy will then just be an analy analytic expression lambda, and you can evaluate it. Um, this is not exact, there, there are some uh, there are some approximations in these which, for which tools are known how to improve them, but let me not get into that now. Um, but you can apply these equations to maybe the simplest types of local operators that uh, <coughs> exist, namely the twist two operators. Um, so for twist two operators, you just take two matrices, you apply some derivatives, um, because the space-time dependence you can also you also should take into account, um, and um, in some sense, these correspond to some tiny bits of string which rotate uh, around an axis in, in this ADS5 
uh, space. And uh, these objects have been looked at for a long time in QFT and their anonymous dimensions are well, well studied in QFT and uh, QCD. Um, the anomalous dimensions are uh, responsible for scale violations in deep inelastic scattering. Some uh, evolution equations have been set up uh, for them and using them as the famous DGLUB and BFKL equations. Um, <coughs> and what maybe excites, what was, what's, what, what's nice here is um, you, can, you can look at the large S uh, behavior. That's sort of when you uh, turn the string slightly longer. Uh, or take the long string limit of that, and, and here it's sort of, um, yeah, it's, you know, you can also view it as sort of pulling these two uh, fields slightly apart. Um, but the nice thing is that um, the uh, anomalous dimension then has a particular scaling behavior, and the leading term um, goes like log of the spin, and the uh, coefficient in front is called the cusp dimension, and that's, that's just a number um, which you can, in principle, compute. And that In O of S, there is a coincidence limit. It's the same point X in, uh, in, in 4D. Say again, in o OS, yeah. Phi. The argument's it's phi of X and phi of X. Yeah, right. It's phi of X and phi of X, but once you put in lots of yeah. derivatives, then sort of it's like a tail expansion and slightly pulling them apart, uh, which is perhaps more easy to understand if you do it the opposite way. Um, but anyway, uh, so, so, you, so an interesting quantity, observable quantity in, 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 in this theory and also in string theory is the cusp dimension or the, or the corresponding energy where, where you just pick our, the coefficient of this leading log behavior. Um, and you can apply these equations to determine um, this quantity for any finite value of s, but if you take s to go to infinity, you'll end up with, uh, with a certain integral equation of this sort. So there is a certain kernel, which I'll describe in a second, and, a f uh, and the solution uh, psi of x. And <coughs> this is the kernel that you need. Uh, you can write it using the Bessel functions, j0 and 1. Uh, in a particular combination, and then there is also some term where you have some convolution of, of these elementary kernels. And the nice thing is once you have a solution to this equation with certain, uh, well, certain boundary conditions, of course, you need, um, then you can easily read off the cusp anomalous dimension as, as this function evaluated at zero. <coughs> um, you can, I mean, the nice thing then, as I, as I explained earlier, is that the coupling constant lambda enters this expression here analytically. For example, here just, it's just a prefactor in, in the exponent, um, and it doesn't enter anywhere else. <coughs> it also enters here, of course. Um, and then you can expand it uh, at sort of at small lambda first, and you get all these terms, which you can also compute by other means in uh, quantum field theory, for example, by gluon scattering amplitudes, uh, all these terms appear, and they have been uh, confirmed up to a very high loop order. Um, in particular, yeah, uh, here in gluon scattering amplitudes, you have a certain uh, well expectation how things exponentiate, how the divergences exponentiate, and the cusp dimension plays a, an important role in that. So. That, that's interesting because it also draws some connection between integrable models and scattering amplitudes, which I'll uh, cover later a bit. <coughs> you can also uh, do an expansion at strong coupling, and then you get a leading term um, which coincides with classical string theory, and then also some quantum uh, world sheet corrections that also match, and that, yeah, that's nice. So you get um, agreement with both sides of this duality. And so let me show you in, in this graph what, um, what the result is. Uh, <coughs> so uh, you can even now compute the cusp dimension using this integral equation at finite lambda. And then you'll see sort of a, a smooth interpolation between uh, the small lambda regime where you have perturbative gauge theory and the large lambda regime um, where you have perturbative strings. 
and it sort of matches nicely with these uh, perturbative extrapolations, as le at least as far as their radius of convergence goes. I mean, the gauge theory does have a finite radius of convergence, apparently, but the string theory is just an asymptotic series. Nevertheless, this interpolating function, which is in red, um, seems to match well with, with the perturbative expansion. So, <coughs> well, that's, that's just one particular quantity here. Here I draw the coupling const, uh, the, the uh, cusp dimension, which was, um, well, computed first numerically by, by this team. And uh, the nice thing is that this uh, you can view as an exact result in a planar four-dimensional gauge theory at finite coupling. So you have this function, which is determined by this particular um, integral equation. Um, <coughs> well, I, I said the, the beta equations were not quite exact, and they are not quite exact when you have a finite size. Um, finite size meaning uh, when, well, well, when the number of matrices in your, in your trace here um, is finite, well, in this case, it's also a finite number, but you have a large number of s, and that somehow compensates. But whenever you have a finite size, uh, sort of, uh, number of matrices, then there need to be some corre corrections. And that's because um, the scattering picture that you need assumes an infinite world sheet. So you have, you sort of think of, in, in the string theory picture, you think of an infinitely extended world sheet. And there you can set up a scattering picture. Um, and then you can compute the scattering matrix. Um, but uh, once you look at the actual string states, these are on a finite cylinder, and the finite cylinder um, uh, the, world the, 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 the scattering matrix for the world sheet is not quite exact. And then you can introduce some Lisha terms, and these correspond to virtual particles which sort of wrap around or w walk around this cylinder, uh, which is now finite. Um, <coughs> there's a whole technique um, associated to that, um, which, is, which goes by the name of the thermodynamic beta ansatz, and, and also, also this there's a double wick rotation. The idea behind that is basically that uh, if, if you have a cylinder, then space has a finite extent, but at least time is infinite. And um, instead of cons considering what you usually do, uh, evolution in time, you could also do an evolution in space, right? So instead of having this time evolution, you do evolution in space, and then your whole time axis is still an infinite line, and on this infinite line, you can set up a, a nice scattering picture. And uh, the next thing that's nice about it is that this, this alternative picture can be obtained by a double wick rotation in two dimensions because, um, well, you can do a time, well, you, if you do a wick rotation on time, you get two spatial directions. But if you then also do a wick rotation on the spatial direction, you get another time direction. And then so you get it from, from a 1, 1, uh, theory, you get to another 1, 1 theory, which happens to be more or less the same. But <coughs> it allows you to treat uh, your uh, scattering picture with an infinite with, with, on an infinite line, which is what you need. Um, from this, uh, you obtain similar types of Betti equations, but now this becomes an infinite set of coupled integral equations, and which is a bit hard to deal with, and then people have uh, yeah, used uh, the a big arsenal of um, techniques related to integral models. Um, these are known by the name of TY system, Hirota equations, uh, Baxter equations, quantum curves, or finite nonlinear integral equations. So these are like the integral equations that I just mentioned, but just somehow there's a way to reduce them to finitely many. <coughs> and um, doing that, you can apply this to particular states, for example, the Konishi state, which is sort of the same state that we had here, but not, not at the upper end of the tower, not, not at uh, the large spin limit, but sort of the smallest one. And that receives some, some of these uh, well, finite size corrections. Those are very important. And then you can compute with these techniques uh, the, uh, the anomalous dimension, um, for example, perturbatively up to 
many orders in, in the loop here. I just displayed the first four orders, but many more are known by now. And again, that gives you a nice interpolation between the weak coupling regime here and uh, a particular finite string uh, solution at, at large lambda. Um, I, can, I can also show you uh, a bit what was achieved using this, um, this map of parameter space. So here is the uh, Toft coupling lambda, and this would be um, the string coupling, GS, or the inverse uh, rank of the matrices. Um, <coughs> and if you look at where the classical regimes of these theories are, well, the classical gauge theory is where lambda is, is small, um, but um, where the rank of the gauge group doesn't really matter. So you can do gauge theory for SU3, you can do it for SU20, you can do it for large n, um, that doesn't make much of a difference. So this is the classical regime of gauge theory. For string theory, you sort of sit in this corner where lambda is large and also the string coupling is, is small. So because you'd always have to do an expansion in the string coupling. When you <coughs> want to go to the quantum gauge theory, you typically do this by Feynman diagrams and loops. And that in that way, you go from this classical regime somewhere to the perturbative gauge theory, towards the quantum gauge theory. In string theory, you can do two different types of expansions. Either you um, look at sort of interact adding interactions to strings, um, where strings can split and join, and that amounts to adding handles to the string world sheet. And here, um, well, when you have a curved target space, then the world sheet theory is, is, a, is a quantum field theory um, with a parameter and you can do expansions. These, these are sort of, per, um, these are curvature corrections uh, sort of to the classical strings which sit here. <coughs> and in this way you can sort of also approach the quantum string regime which sits anywhere in the middle of this uh, chart. Um, <coughs> the planar limit somehow connects, uh, well, is, is along this line where um, the rank is large or GS is uh, zero, so you're on this line. And the nice thing is that this line connects the two regimes, and this is the regime where you get integrability. Using the tools of integrability, one can now compute functions, um, well, interpolating functions going all the way from here to there, at least for some observables. And that, that's what has been achieved. <coughs> um, yeah, let me mention some achievements using integrability. Um, I already mentioned there is some scattering picture on the two-dimensional world sheet. So the string theory here is a, is a two-dimensional field theory on which you can set up a scattering problem. And uh, well, that's what you would you know, typically do also in, in strings in flat space. You, you look at the excitations of the string world sheet around a trivial solution and um, these, these are geometric uh, things because uh, you get eight bosonic uh, excitations which correspond to the eight transverse directions of the string and maybe also eight fermionic excitations because it's a superstring. <coughs> and in this particular uh, scattering picture here, um, you have a residual <coughs> symmetry coming from the isometries that are left over and these are two copies of this Lie super algebra SU2 slash 2. And, uh, and you have a scattering matrix which respects this symmetry. And the nice thing is that um, using integrability, well, using just the symmetries actually, you can determine what this um, scattering matrix for two particles is um, as a function of, of the momenta, on the, of the world sheet momenta of these particles and as a function of, uh, of the world sheet coupling lambda. So you, you have an expression which works at finite uh, coupling strength. And the nice thing is that, well, this two-particle scattering matrix is of a particular form which uh, is compatible with integrability. Uh, it, it allows factorized multi-particle scattering because it satisfies the young baxter equation. And so um, then, at least with the assumption that this is a factorized scattering problem, you can um, you can derive all n-particle scattering processes only through the two-particle scattering process. Um, <coughs> well, 
Concerning symmetry, this scattering matrix gives rise to some unusual non-local type of symmetry, which is known as the Youngian algebra. <coughs> and the Youngian algebra here is more or less a Youngian of, of, the, of this algebra, SU2 slash 2, or maybe U2 slash 2, or maybe some deformation of it, which is not completely um, under good control in, in terms of mathematics, but because, well, it has some extensions, central extensions and derivations which, which are not quite covered by the usual framework. <coughs> um, so investigations of this algebra are, are still uh, going on. Um, another, well, so this, this is about the, the scattering matrix, which I just wanted to um, mention because it, it, it plays a central role in anything, any calculation that you want to do on this string world sheet. Um, and you can even apply it to the computation of correlation functions. Now, correlation functions, what I mean is, uh, is correlation functions in the gauge theory. So you take several local operators. These would be, each local operator would be maybe a, a trace of a product of matrices at different space-time points. And so these, these are the uh, essential observables you can compute in any uh, CFT be it two-dimensional or higher dimensional. And um, then for such objects, you can also do a genus expansion, and this would sort of be a genus one contribution to a four-point function. <coughs> the trouble is, um, if you want to apply integrability, then um, you realize that this works best if the string world sheet has the topology of an annulus or, or even of a disk. These are the cases which you can address well with integrability, and this is a case which you cannot really address well. But what you do, what you should do is, um, you should do what you usually do in string theory uh, if you want to look at higher genus corrections, namely you patch your world sheet uh, together from pairs of pans. And a pair of pans is not among these, but you can even glue a pair of pans from two, or basically two hexagons. Um, so you take two hexagons, glue, glue these uh, at, uh, at these indicated sides together to form a pair of pans. And that's, that's, that's sort of what's at the heart of um, what's known as the hexagon approach using integrability. So then, um, you know, once you have a pair of pans, you can glue this together to any, any surface that you want. And uh, then in principle, you can compute correlation functions. Um, this is still, I mean, any genus expansion, if you've ever tried it, is, is a difficult thing to do. Um, but at least, I mean, the, the, the promise at least in this approach is that um, you can understand these, uh, these uh, patches here at finite coupling strength, at finite lambda. So that at least gives you some hope of computing these correlation functions at finite coupling strength. <coughs> and then in principle, you can do a genus expansion, or you hope that someday one can do it. It might just be difficult in practice, but uh, by gluing together these things, you can get more and more complicated uh, Riemann surfaces that give you higher genus corrections. And that would be in this picture um, where, uh, where, where you engage theory, you usually start with a with the classical gauge theory and then do a loop expansion to go towards the middle. Um, this may open another way of approaching the middle of the diagram by starting at this line and then sort of doing the genus expansion and going from, from here, which where you can get exact results going perturbatively towards the middle of the diagram. Um, another context where integrability plays a role is, um, is planar scattering in gauge theory. Uh, <coughs> so, for a long time, color-ordered planar scattering amplitudes have been investigated, um, well, because it's, well, it's the natural object you would look at anyway at, at tree level, and then also quantum corrections, loop corrections can be computed. And, uh, much progress has been made over the last 15 years, mainly using on-shell methods, but then also some geometric and uh, methods and uh, methods using integrability. Uh, one particular aspect of scattering amplitudes is that they have infrared divergences. 
and there's a certain infrared factorization scheme for such a scattering amplitude. And uh, roughly, well, schematically you can say scattering amplitude is given by the tree level times loop corrections, which you can write in, in sort of uh, some exponential form. And this exponent the exponent still has some divergences, but these divergences are just given in terms of the one loop divergence times the cusp dimension. And that's where, again, the cusp dimension uh, plays a role. And once you have removed the divergences, some finite remainder function re <coughs> remains. Well, so that means uh, a scattering amplitude exp is expressed through this uh, tree level scattering factor, the one loop factor, which is IR divergent, the cusp dimension, and some finite remainder function. And uh, a long time ago, an intriguing observation has been made for scattering amplitudes with at least with four and five legs, namely that this remainder function turned out to be zero. <coughs> or maybe not necessarily zero, but just a constant, so no, no interesting function. Um, and this, this has been uh, computed and confirmed even at four loops using unitarity methods. And um, if, if you believe it, then that's, that's actually an exact result for scattering amplitudes at finite lambda. So you, you do get, you have the option in, in a particular, in the, I mean, if you believe this conjecture, then, uh, then you realize that you know a scattering amplitude in a four-dimensional gauge theory at finite coupling, which is quite interesting. So, of course, if, well, you should ask yourself, why is this so simple? And uh, maybe is there a way to generalize this even beyond five legs? Now, beyond five legs at six legs or more, this finite remainder function is going to be non-trivial. Um, but that doesn't mean it, uh, that you cannot determine it. Maybe there's a way to obtain it for six particles at finite coupling. <coughs> and that, that would be great. Now, let me see the... Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll explain why this is so in a minute. So um, the ADS-CFT correspondence provides a, a string analog for planar scattering amplitudes. Um, so if you have a planar scattering amplitude in the gauge theory, um, you can relate this to the area of a minimal surface in ADS-5. Um, <coughs> and um, here, yeah, this minimal surface is determined by a, a certain null polygon which, which ends on the boundary of ADS5. And the nice thing is that um, by using this duality, uh, you can also use another uh, correspondence in this ADS-CFT dictionary, namely saying that a minimal surface in ADS5 ending on some contour on the boundary corresponds to a Wilson loop observable in the gauge theory. And that, that's nice because now you have a cor correspondence or a duality between an object, between a scattering amplitude and a certain Wilson loop in the gauge theory. And that's something you can compute directly in the gauge theory without any ADS-CFT um, well, considerations. And, you can, uh, and, and it's even something which you can compare perturbatively. So there, there's a way to compare perturbatively objects of this kind to objects of this kind. <coughs> and the ADS-CFT term would be that, that uh, these two objects are related by, by, well, what in string theory is known as T-duality. Um, and that's, that's a nice thing in terms of, in, I mean, because it also gives you some relationship to integrability and to enhance symmetries. And so let's look at the symmetries back of, of N equals 4, super young mills. So as I told you, it's a superconformal theory. It has this uh, PSU 2.2 slash 4 <coughs> symmetry. And I, uh, in this context, I like to draw this, the, all the generators of, of this uh, group in, in sort of uh, this disk. So you have momentum generators, you have supersymmetry generators, some rotation and scale generators, and the special conformal generators. And the point is that once you have a symmetry, then the observables uh, typically respect the symmetry. So uh, scattering amplitudes should be, in some sense, conformally invariant, and also Wilson loops should be conformally invariant. <coughs> However, um, the conformal symmetry that, that you have here 
acts in a different way on amplitudes and Wilson loops. And so you have some symmetries which sort of act on, uh, in, in the ordinary way, on, on, on amplitudes. Um, but, but these are not the same symmetries um, as, as in the other picture. And so you sort of get two different sets of conformal symmetries which in, by, by this duality are related by T-duality. And um, so then you see, well, you have two different sets of symmetries, but the interesting point is that these are not completely distinct. They, they uh, overlap on a certain subset of the generators. So some of these generators act the same on both pictures and some <coughs> generators act differently. And when, when you are in this situation, you can um, do commutators of, of these symmetries. You can sort of mix the two symmetries and generate new symmetries. And when you go, go on, you find new, more and more new symmetries and you get a whole tower of new symmetry generators. And that is what is known as the Youngian algebra. So, um, so in this sense, um, this uh, duality between scattering amplitudes and Wilson loops, or the T-duality, um, sort of makes, uh, at the end of the day, gives you a whole tower of infinite, or infinite dimensional tower of new symmetries. Um, <coughs> and then, as I said, um, this also explains why some of these scattering amplitudes are uh, so simple, and that's basically because you have no conformal cross ratios uh, for four and five external particles. And that's not ordinary conformal cross ratios, but these are dual conformal cross ratios. Um, and they, they act like the ordinary conformal cross ratios, but they have a different form. And um, no such dual cross ratios exist for four and five external particles, because uh, in some sense these are null directions, and so you need more than five to come up with something which is non-trivial. And that just means if you have no conformal cross ratios, this remainder function can actually depend on nothing and must be a constant. And uh, so that explains the triviality. Whereas uh, starting from six particles, you do have conformal cross ratios and then this remainder function can uh, now depend on them. Okay. <coughs> so, um, yeah. As I mentioned, uh, these scattering amplitudes are related to Wilson loops. Um, one problem if you, if you want to address s symmetries um, for observables is if these observables produce divergences, and unfortunately these null polygonal Wilson loops, just as the scattering amplitudes, they produce some divergences. But there's a better object you can look at, namely just ordinary smooth Wilson loops uh, and uh, so-called Malasena Wilson loops, which also couple to the scalars in a particular way. And the nice thing about them is that they uh, avoid having divergences in n equals 4 sub Young mills. And um, you can then act with symmetries on, on these uh, Wilson loops. So a Wilson loop is a, is a contour in space-time, and if you act with conformal symmetry, then basically you just transform this contour in space-time in the way conformal symmetry dictates to you. And that's how, um, well, a conformal variation on acts on the Wilson loop. So, <coughs> it, but, but there's a different way of, of viewing this. Namely, um, either you sort of, if you look at an infinitesimal transformation, you take this contour and shift it slightly. But this shift uh, can also be represented by an insertion into the Wilson loop where you sort of just shift the contour in, in that direction locally. And, and that means if you have this Wilson loop operator, which is this path-ordered exponential, uh, you insert sort of the, um, the transformation uh, acting on a, on a single gauge field and integrate that over the point to have this infinitesimal transformation realized. And that's just how, how you represent symmetry. Or uh, infinitesimal symmetries. <coughs> and the point is then, it, if this is a symmetry, then the expectation value of this combination would be zero, because an infinitesimal transformation should not change the expectation value, right? <coughs> what is yeah. the cycle here, or this first integral? Uh, this is just your contour, or? I'm tracing 
written first one. This one. No, no, the second one. This, uh, one. Yeah, this one. What is the integral? Ah, okay. Well, um, that's you have your Wilson loop. It's it's a closed contour. You integrate once around it with this, and then um, th this just means you insert this in. I mean, because because this is under the path uh, ordering. You, a Wilson loop is a path ordered exponential, right? So it's a p tray. Get the trace p x. And then here it's an integral over the gauge field around. I mean, this is the this is the parallel transport of the gauge field. And here, what you do is basically you insert this under the path ordering into the appropriate spot. Um, it's just a fancy way. You could also write this as going from going from your start to this point, then inserting j a, and then going from there to the end. Um, yeah, don't know how to explain this much better right now. But uh, so, what? Why I wanted to show this to you is um, because the Youngian, this these uh, additional generators that I just talked about, have a similar form acting on on Wilson loops, but um, they insert two of these insertions into the Wilson loop at different points. Um, and each of them is determined by, by the conformal transformation and then you somehow contract these by structure constants. And this gives you a new sort of object uh, and if this is a symmetry then the expectation value of this combination should be zero. So that gives you new identities for your theory. As I said here, Youngian invariance of the Wilson loop then means that the expectation value of well, the conformal variation is zero, but also of these additional symmetries is, is zero. Um, <coughs> now, if you expand, I mean, the, yeah, if you expand Wilson loops at weak coupling, you do this by basically inserting propagators between two points on the Wilson loop at the first order. So uh, the, the first co uh, correction is you insert a propagator between two <coughs> points and integrate over all pairs of points. And then for the conformal variation, what you get here is basically you, uh, you do the deformation at one of these two points and, um, and then once you integrate over, over this, you get zero, irrespectively of which contour you take. That's, that's, that's the symmetry statement. And for the level one symmetry, um, the, the invariant statement means you uh, vary two, both ends of this propagator um, by conformal transformation and then you contract them with the structure constants of the conformal group <coughs> and again that after integration miraculously gives you a zero and that means you have some additional symmetry in your theory somehow. And that, that means you have Youngian invariance for Wilson loops at, at the first perturbative order. Now one thing I'm certainly interested in now is uh, computing higher perturbative orders um, and see whether at higher perturbative orders where you have more insert, more, more propagators or maybe some vertices inside here, um, whether these still respect the symmetry and uh, this is in particular a question for anomalies. So <coughs> let me summarize here the status of ADS-CFT integrability. So, as I've shown you, um, the implications of integrability have been understood quite well for several observables. Um, they have been applied to compute finite coupling corrections. Um, interestingly, some very well-defined math concepts of quantum groups appear at leading weak order and some perturbative corrections um, in terms of math are under control. Um, it's also understood well what is the integral structure of classical string theory on ADS5 plus S5, but um, altogether it's, it's not really known or it was not really known what is integrability for this model at all. Um, in particular, how can you define it um, and uh, you would have to define it before you want to prove it and then how can you prove this integrability. And as I said, well, the math concepts at leading weak order are under good control, but what happens at higher loops and at finite coupling? 
So many results have been obtained and they are trustworthy, but um, of course we would like to know uh, for sure that um, all these techniques work and for what reason do they work. And so let me uh, then talk about this Youngian symmetry of this theory a bit um, <coughs> before stopping. So if you think about it, what, what you should be aiming for is, is to show that uh, the action of your model of n equals 4 super young mills or maybe correspondingly of the string theory, that this has a certain extended symmetry, namely a Youngian symmetry. And I'll, I'll just call j hat some particular Youngian symmetry generator. But the question was uh, for a long time, how can you apply this symmetry generator to the action in order to uh, verify this statement? Um, in particular, um, if you look at the action of a gauge theory, it's hardly clear what you mean by the planar contribution or non-planar contributions to the action. How can you distinguish them? And that's in particular relevant because you expect integrability to be there only in the planar limit. So whatever statement you, you make must only be valid in the, in the planar limit. And also which representation of a symmetry should you take? Maybe some free representation or nonlinear or quantum. How does that work? Um, <coughs> but at least there have been some hints that some statement like this should hold. And one reason is that um, you can look at Wilson loops and the Wilson loop, as I said, does does display Youngian symmetry and when you do a Wilson loop OPE, that is if you take the Wilson loop to be smaller and smaller um, and do an expansion around small radius, so then in some order you find the Lagrangian of the theory. And so if you think, well, the Wilson loop is invariant then perhaps the Lagrangian should also be some, or so show some signs of integrability of this invariance. And there are some essential features of the action that in principle make this possible. The action is single trace, so um, in the large n uh, in the large n way of thinking about things uh, it, ha it has a disk topology which as I mentioned earlier is, is something which is nice for integrability. The action is conformal and that's also a requirement in this particular setting. <coughs> and also maybe something that, that is very useful is that the action is not renormalized. The coupling constant is not renormalized. The beta function is exactly zero. And that maybe helps in establishing that there are no anomalies even for this symmetry. Um, but we didn't know what, uh, what this statement actually means. So we first of all applied this symmetry generator to the equations of motion and wanted to see whether whatever it produces uh, well, if you have a symmetry, whatever it produces, it should again be equations of motion. Um, in particular, if you want a consistent formulation of a symmetry, this statement really needs to be true in the quantum theory. And the Dirac equation is easiest, so let me schematically show you the Dirac equation. It's, a, it's a d slash psi, uh, where this is a covariant derivative, plus maybe this u cover term. So if you write it out, it's these three terms. <laughs> And now you can act with some bilocal level one generator on, on these fields and you get certain numbers of contributions. In particular those here, um, those are very non-trivial and these are the non-local non corrections. Um, and, uh, but, but their form is, is precisely known. And what, I mean, then we looked at this equation and we found some way of putting a consistent, uh, well, I mean these expressions were not known, but we could invent something so that this equation holds. And not only this equation holds, but all the other equations of motion uh, did display the symmetry also for all the other generators. So <coughs> we, we could establish that the equations of motion are young and invariant with a consistent set of, uh, well, representations. Um, now, if we have an exact symmetry in a quantum field theory, that usually gives you some Ward or Ward Takahashi identities. Um, but what you need is that the action is invariant, and the invariance of the equation of motion would not quite be sufficient for that. And in addition, you would want for the quantum theory that there are no quantum anomalies. So, in principle, 
quantum theory could invalidate some classical symmetries. So we wanted to show the invariance of the action, but there were some difficulties, namely cyclicity we, and nonlinearity. Um, don't have good chance to explain what what the problem is here, but um, using the invariance of the equation of motion, which we had already established, we could construct this uh, j hat on S um, in such a way that it's exactly zero uh, for n equals four super young mills, and it's actually not zero for other models. Um, this way the symmetry acts has some very unusual features. Somehow the coefficients depend on the number of fields they act on. You have some strange overlapping bilocal terms and also the gauge invariant of gauge invariance of this uh, construction is not really manifest. But the nice thing is it, it does give you zero, uh, you know, after you cancel many terms, you get zero in classical n equals four super young mills, and you don't get zero in other gauge theories that um, maybe n equals two super young mills. <coughs> and that's basically how it acts, J on the field. Well, I, I, I don't show it here, but um, uh, it's a few lines expression, um, and it's nonlinear in the fields, and you need some framework to write this down, but yes, I mean, it, it acts in a very well-defined way. You don't get it where n equals n equals two. You said n equal, well. So, for example, pure n equals two super young mills is not expected to be integrable, and this symmetry does not hold. Even the conformal reduction when n f is equal to two n c. Well, there are some quantum conformal n equals two models, and there you do indeed get a chance of having integrability, for the reason that. N equals four, you can over, you can often somehow orbifold or reduce to an n equals two model, and then some sometimes you can preserve integrability. But but these are indeed the cases where where integrability is most likely preserved. But p uh, what what I meant here is if you just have pure n equals two super young mills without additional matter, then it fails. <coughs> I should really get to an end. Um, just let me say what else we've done. We've looked at correlation functions of several gauge fields and uh, then the Youngian symmetry um, implies some uh, Ward-Takahashi identities which you can sort of sketch like this and we've verified this. Um, uh, the problem in or conceptual problem is that once you do compute, uh, once you compute correlation functions, you need to fix a gauge in a gauge theory, and once you fix a gauge, uh, this fixing of gauge may be in conflict with the symmetries. So we had to look at BRST gauge fixing, and well, at the end of the day, um, the structures are much more complicated, but you can still uh, write uh, ward type identities uh, and show also that the gauge fix action is invariant. And one thing that remains to be settled is whether uh, you can have anomalies, um, whether the symmetry has anomalies and whether it can have anomalies. Um, the, I mean, tools for investigating anomalies are well known, but it's not so clear because here you have a non-local type of symmetry. Um, it's not really non-local in space-time, it's, it's rather non-local in color space and that sort of refers to what I have here. Um, so you have a symmetry which probably just acts locally in space-time, but non-locally on, on such polynomials and sort of correspondingly in the string theory world she did acts non-locally. <coughs> However, I, I mean, I don't believe that there will be anomalies because uh, we know that integrability appears to work well at finite lambda, so if somehow integrability would be lost, then somehow these results should be wrong, but they seem to be okay. Um, so one way we want to address this is to consider the Wilson loop at higher orders, and then we get some additional contributions which potentially can see the anomaly, uh, but we'll have to regularize that very carefully, and that actually produces many, many terms of, of this kind, and we'll have to see whether this all sums up to zero for generic contours. Okay, <coughs> yeah, so uh, my conclusions, or just what I did in this talk, is I reviewed ADS-CFT integrability, 
sh shown you the motivation and uh, some constituent models. Um, I've told you what, what uh, is the planar spectrum and how you can obtain it at finite coupling and also further progress in terms of uh, correlators, scattering amplitudes and <coughs> Wilson loops. And in, in the <coughs> latter part of the talk, I've discussed Youngian symmetry of planar n equals four super Young Mills. And um, in a nutshell, uh, we've shown that the equations of motion and the action of the model are invariant. So in that sense, classical planar n equals four super Young Mills is, uh, is an integrable model. Um, we've set up Ward Takashi identities, which arise due to this extended symmetry. Um, we've shown that the symmetry is compatible with gauge fixing, but it actually does introduce some new interesting BRST type structures, which I guess are not under, <laughs> under very good control mathematically. Anyway, and um, we expect that there will be no quantum anomalies, but that still needs to be settled. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, questions, comments? Uh, maybe on this last topic you mentioned yeah. the word identities, it's a yeah. bit sketchy. Uh, sure, sorry. For example, for a three-point function, does it change the number of uh, traces? Meaning, you no. know, the, the Youngian operator does, does just keep the number of traces three. <coughs> Uh, no, sorry. Um, the, these are co yeah. Uh, uh, this might be confusing, but here I want to look at correlators of individual fields. Um, the thing you do in in your quantum field theory one textbook, correlators of of three or four fields, um, and since these are colored objects, you need to fix a gauge to make sense of this. This is not uh, an invariant operator which you wrote before. No, no. I mean, these are in some sense at the heart of them. You can always patch them together, but then you have coincident points, and that introduces some other problems. And will, would the number of traces change once you, if you look? At no, it? no. Sorry, um, there is a reason why we do this because um, because we like the disk topology. Whereas if you had three, four traces, then you would have to connect this by a higher, well, not not really higher genus surface, but a surface with holes. And that leads you to some situation which integrability does not really address. So we can only do uh, we can only do this topology, and that's why we need these types of correlation functions. Uh, I'm not an expert at all, but since you talk about integrability here, the, um, so is that the usual? Um, sigma model integrability with values in a, a symmetric homogeneous. In, in the, I mean, the string theory picture is exactly that. So it's, it corresponds to these old works by Paul Meyer yeah. and and uh, okay. yeah. and so the Youngian uh, you have a classical R matrix with uh, yes. spectral parameter etc. Yes. Yes. So yeah. as I said, this is all under rather good control in the string theory, in the classical string theory. Um, but the picture in the ADS-CFT uh, dual gauge theory is not so clear and that, I mean, it actually more relates to quantum integrability, whereas this is classical integrability. I also thought of it when you said the non-local. Other, uh, Harold had a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, so how much of these results go through if you switch on a, a B field so that the n equal 4 becomes non-commutative n equal 4, which is in a sense a matrix model? Do you know? If, if I don't know. Uh, if you're lucky, everything. <laughs> uh, well, okay, there, there is a nice, there, okay, there, there is a nice thing what you can do on the string theory. You can deform the string theory uh, background. Um, and you can deform it in such a way that you get sort of the two-form field. Right. And then if you do it, if, if you then transform it to the ga gauge theory, you would expect it to be a non-commutative kind of gauge theory. It's just that this type of, I mean, you need, to write, you, you need to do the right transformation, and then you would have to have a nice 
uh, well, non-gauge theory on a non-commutative space, which I, I'm not really too familiar, but, but there is an integrable deformation that corresponds to it. So I, I, would, I would say some models of this should exist. Maxim, yeah. I have just a very stupid terminological question, but <coughs> most of from the very beginning. Yeah. I'm not an integral system, but what I heard about Youngians, it's horribly complicated algebra with co-product. It's not Lie algebra at all. Yes. And when you said it's X on some, uh, forgot, do you need to really co a co-product? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. sorry, I, I, okay, I, I tried to make this non-technical, but I should have maybe... This, this, well, okay, uh, I was, I was here. This is the co, this is the co-product right. that you need, because um, here you sort of just have a local action, yeah, okay. and this, this, this is the co-product of the Youngian. Yeah, I see. Yeah, and the second question, if it's uh, not large, but how it can act on the space of classical solutions? It does. I didn't say that. Ah, yeah, it's, it's a time the young and acts on classical I did not, no, it, it's the symmetry of the classical theory. I didn't say it acts on classical solutions. The equation of motions, you write it acts on equations of motions. Huh? It transforms, yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to discuss what, what this actually oh, means. Algebra can act on something completely. Um, well, the point is that, um, that you need to look at polynomials of the fields. And then the ordering within this polynomial matters. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure you can you can make it act on yeah. on solutions. Well, it's, a, it's a good question. I just don't have a very. I think we should talk about it and find out the answer. <laughs> You uh, restricted your considerations to S U N. Yeah. But uh, could I not have considered S O N? Uh, you could probably do that um, because in the large n limit there is not too much of a difference, and it would just somehow project out half of your states or something like that, which are invariant under this uh, automorphism. But that hasn't been done. Uh, I think that there have been investigations of that, and it still works as far as I understand. Yes. But it's, I mean, it doesn't change much about the integral structure. Well, if there are no more questions and comments, let's thank the